Okay, thank you all for coming today to learn a little bit more about storytelling. On Tuesday, we did storytelling with the written word, but today we're gonna focus on visual storytelling with photography in particular, learning how to capture images that tell your story in an impactful way. So we always just remind people of our mission, our surf rider mission and we're just going to show these slides at the beginning of every session, just in case new people are joining. And a reminder of our statement on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We want clean water and healthy beaches for all people. That is a big part of what we're doing here at Surfrider. And of course, since we're calling in from different spots in Oregon, we're going to take a moment to read this land acknowledgement so you can all read this to yourselves. And we're going to move into the presentation. So we all have stories to tell, but how can we capture images that really draw people in, get them invested in that story and trying to understand that story. So to talk about photography, we have a special guest, Ben Moon, one of our own surf rider volunteers. So Bree, maybe you can introduce a little more. Yeah. Yeah. So Ben is the vice chair of the Three Capes chapter. They just were formally approved by headquarters yesterday as a chapter. So super exciting. I haven't even emailed our whole network about it yet because it happened at the end of the day yesterday. Um, but vice chair of our brand new chapter, Three Capes, based in Pacific City. And I'm really, really thankful that Ben is spending some time with us today. Uh, he is a professional photographer and videographer, and you can see his work in Patagonia catalogs, among other places. A couple of you have already kind of peeked at his website to get a glimpse of um, his photography. You might also recognize him or his name from the video or book Denali such a beautiful story of Ben and his dog Denali. So uh, Ben, I'll hand it over to you. Um, hi all. Um, yeah, it's great to, great to be here um, with you all. I'm gonna keep it pretty casual. Um, I'm really excited that we are finally recognized as a chapter here too. It's been um, such a beautiful area here and it's great to um, have a voice um, represented. Um, so I'm gonna use a few examples of my work. I'm gonna share my screen here and um, just show a few basic concepts that most of you probably already know, but I just, I'll just kind of run through a few things to kind of think about with um, photography. And this can apply to anything. It's not just with a professional camera. It's, it's um, I mean, I probably shoot with my iPhone about 70% of the time anyway. It's just what we have with us and so um, oftentimes, especially at events and things, it's like, it's your iPhone, I'm getting to know that. And it's kind of blown me away how powerful that tool can be um, and how incredible the imagery is. Um, when I got a first, my first digital camera back in 2005, um, it was an eight megapixel cam that cost me about $6,000 used. And um, I have a few images of Jerry Lopez shaping that I've printed several times and it's incredible how <laughs> my iPhone takes better photos than that thing did. Um, so uh, don't be, get too hung up on the, the gear. It's all about um, your eye and the perspective and how you see the world. And so um, if you're the only person there to capture a moment, that's the moment, the moment happens then. And so it's better to capture it with what you have than to overthink it um, and think you don't have the ability to do, to do so. Um, so let's see. How do I do this? So go to my website real quick. And um, so just a few things to think about. Um, actually, 
trying to think of some perspectives. So one of the most common mistakes is to try to capture too much of one thing um, and to not, not really focus on what's happening. Um, for instance, like say, like for say for trash cleanup, just showing a photo of just the trash and not where you are, a sense of place and so perspective. Um, so I was trying to find images that would uh, have leading lines, something that would pull you into, into an image um, and not just, you know, you're shooting over the shoulder of someone. I've shot for Patagonia for about 20 years now. And a lot of times it's not about sh shooting a portrait straight on. It's about, it's about kind of drawing someone into the image with lines and leading lines. So I'm actually going to show a couple examples of that. Um, for instance, this photo of a climber, the lines draw you into the, into the frame. Um, and you can do that with the, with the edge of a beach. You can do that with, um, you know, something lying in the sand, um, the patterns in the sand, whatever, you know, there's a lot of ways of using a line of a building or someone's arm or whatever to draw you into it, to, into a picture. Um, and trying to capture, this is a good example of real thirds to the, um, if you imagine this doing a tic-tac-toe frame on the, on the image, um, to divide it into thirds, both directions, vertically and horizontally, you, you know, try not to place the horizon line directly in the center, try to, you know, see how the beach up there is at, towards the top. And then the van is actually in the bottom third. And then the line, the leading line is the road brings you down to the beach. This is in Norway at Hodavik, um, a little surf town. And so it brings you down into the image. And so trying to find things that will pull you in and, and bring perspective um, and not put the, you know, see how that the line of the forest kind of draws, draws through the frame, kind of trying to make it feel like it's not just a, a, a square box. Um, also like this image is with a telephoto and all, a lot of phones now have a, a, the two times lens, which is the telephoto. And oftentimes if an image doesn't look interesting, I'll just, I'll just double that, you know, hit that. And suddenly you have this whole new perspective, um, and you can kind of capture more of a portrait. Here's a good example of leading lines drawing you to the surfer walking through the frame there and the buildings kind of bring you, bring you in as well. Um, here's kind of a rule of thirds. It's all um, divided up in the, this, the subjects in the middle, but everything kind of brings you into that portion as well. Um, and here's more examples of rule of thirds. Um, the climbers off in that upper, upper right, left hand third and the horizon is at the lower third. And then here, um, the climbers over on, the, on that one edge and then you're kind of drawn through and then you can kind of see the forest and Lake Louise behind. Um, this is um, in Yosemite Al Cap and it's kind of a good example of like the thirds but also the leading lines bring you down to the climber. I love in climbing, it's really easy to bring that perspective because and often in a wave too, if you're off to the side of a wave, you'll see, it'll just pull you towards the towards um, the surfer or towards um, the cape or whatever. And here's another third, like the, the water's all above. Um, it's my friend Belinda in Australia years ago. Um, and then this is another rule of thirds here. Like you got, you got the horizon lines aren't in the, this one's pretty centered, but it's just kind of finding the ways of bringing yourself into the image. Um, and then Perspective too, it's another one thing with perspective is like trying to find an angle um, that isn't maybe what you'd expect getting lower. Um, oftentimes on our phones, um, the camera's up in the upper upper corner. And so if you can, you can almost set that right on the ground on the beach and use, use the camera there to, 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 so you're looking up at the image instead of, you know, oftentimes we're just holding it up here. And if we get down low, it'll get a different perspective of what's going on um, and then getting, this is an example of a wide angle lens. Um, I love this image because it's my photo. My friend, uh, Daniel Norris, he pitches for the Tigers and we're camping in a gas station somewhere in like Missouri or something and he's cooking dinner and I love that. And he's still the same, this is five years ago and he's still doing the same thing. Um, and, uh, but the, it's a wide angle getting low you know, showing, pulling you into the image and, and showing kind of what's going on, but also gives you perspective. He's at a car wash. Obviously he's not camping at some beautiful area. Um, he's just making dinner. Um, and then here's something of him. This is him actually on the Oregon coast up in Gearhart, I think. 
um, just stacking stacking things in a, in a row so you're drawn drawn toward the back of the image and not and this is also a good example of a portrait but it's also telling a story he's at the beach he's in front of his van and it's obviously raining um, this is drawing you towards you know it's a, a way to get away from just a, a normal image something you can duck behind something find you know find a branch or you know a log on the beach find a way to obscure part of the image and then that makes makes the focal point more interesting and just trying to find unique angles like getting low looking up um, and like here's an example of ducking behind a branch to show someone um, and then this is a great example of leading lines i mean there's a curved sidewalk is a dream or a river or or just a, a the curve of a beach or or anything in nature nature has so many things like that and then portraits are just finding ways of finding fun moments um or getting detail shots this is alex honnold's hands um just finding a way to show the story of something without showing you know the person or the actual object um getting getting in there and just kind of finding a moment and um finding interesting things to be around them so it, it brings i love candid moments i think that's what's really um, driven my career entire career just finding moments in between and like i said if, if you're there with your phone and that happens um capture it and um the great thing is about digital is you can just keep shooting and there's no uh you're not doesn't cost you the development of film so um try to think if there's anything else um having a great background is key too um we have that you know in here in oregon we have beautiful opportunity to just there's so many beautiful backdrops so if you're if you're looking straight out the ocean and you don't have there's nothing back there if you go up the beach or down the beach to find find a way to find a backdrop um that's oftentimes one of the ways of going um this is a good example of just like a leading line that brings you through the frame over at Smith Rock. Um, climbing was climbing always made me was a fascinating way of like use it, utilizing leading lines because there's always a climb as you're climbing, you're always going up something. Um, um, let's see, I'll stop sharing for now. And um, the other thing that I want to talk about is Oftentimes when you just shoot a photo with your phone, um, there's a lot of apps that you can use to make images look a little bit better. Um, but my favorite for years has been um, one called Snapseed. Um, it used to be, it was made by this company that makes all these um, filters for, to make images look like film or whatnot. And they used to charge $5 for it back when that seemed like a lot for an app, but it was one of the most powerful I couldn't believe how powerful it was um, to have that little piece of software. And then Google Google bought them and now it's just free. And you can, if you just kind of play around in that app, you can really learn how to really push your images a long way. A lot of presets, but then you can save presets and make, you know, if you find something you really, really like, you can do that. And playing with um, the contrast and the saturation and just the key with photography editing is not to overdo it because um, there's, you know, the HDR, the high dynamic range look can really make photos look, it'll bring up the shadows and bring down the highlights, but if you do it too far, it's gonna look crazy. And so finding a way to just, just enhance the images just enough to make them feel a little more like what your eye saw, but not try to go overboard. Um, but the other thing is you don't even need to use Snapseed or an app like that or Photoshop or Lightroom. Um, in your Photos app on a phone now, if you're using an iPhone, it has an edit um, key in every single image. You just hit edit. And I've found sometimes just hitting auto and then just playing with the different sliders within that, you can really, um, it's a better starting spot than any other auto I've ever seen, honestly. Um, sometimes it goes way too far, but it's a great way to just, you know, play with the, play with the contrast a little bit. Um, Oftentimes people are confused by what saturation and vibrance means. Vibrance um, will bring up the kind of the blues and the greens and things without making people's skin tones look crazy. Um, and oftentimes if you, if you bring up the vibrance a tiny bit, the sky will start to pop. And, um, and then same with highlights. If oftentimes we're at the beach, it's really bright. 
you, you drop down the highlights a little bit and it'll kind of bring the colors out again. Um, but again, just not overdoing it. That's the key is just kind of playing with it. What I like to do is I, I'll play with an image, save it. I'll look away and look at something that gives me perspective and then look back at it again. And especially before I'm going to post it online or something like, what was I thinking here? <laughs> or walk into a different room in a different light. Cause oftentimes if you're editing an image at night and you use night shift, which I think everybody should because the blue light keeps you awake at night. Um, turn off, if you're going to edit it for color, turn off the night shift for a minute just to, just to, otherwise it'll look way too warm. And then when you, when you manipulate it, it will, won't look right the next day. I've had that happen before with, you know, because night shift mode or it used to be flux or whatever you used to edit at night or use your computer at night you wake up the next morning and it's online and you're like, what, the, what was I thinking? <laughs> it's, um, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, another thing, if you, if you are using a camera um, that has, you know, the ability to put a, put a filter over the, the lens um, around water, a circular polarizer, um, polarizing filter will, will really, they kind of are short CP, like people call them CPL for short. Um, those will do wonders for, um, reducing reflections on the water, just like a polarized sunglasses will, will um, reducing the reflections on the water. And with those, the circular polarizers, you twist it over the lens and as you turn it, you'll see the sky and the water, like the reflections disappear. Um, and that will really deepen the colors. And um, oftentimes, actually the thing about polarizing lenses, that actually this um, surfer uh, down in Ojai who was in a lot of the old surf movies, John Swift, he, he told me once, um, he's an astrophysicist and he was like, you know, the best, the reason why polarizing filters work the best at midday is because that the, the sun is at a right angle to the lens, the polarizing filter. And that's when it works the best. And so um, sometimes at high noon, everybody's like, the light's terrible. But if you have a polarizing filter, oftentimes it'll make the beach environment look really beautiful. And some of my favorite old photos for Patagonia were shot at high noon in that. So, and I've, off, I've often too, if I just have a pair of polarizing sunglasses, Sometimes you just hold them up over your lens and sometimes it'll shift the colors a little bit, but it actually will, it, it can make the image look at least interesting or more beautiful. Um, and now with stories, you know, and being able to share things on Instagram in a, in a more playful way, it's fun to not have be so serious about every image looking perfect, but the more you can bring into one frame to tell a story, the more that that image will be interesting. And um, like I said, like not just shooting, whatever the focal point of the thing is, but shooting enough of the story, like the, um, like here in Pacific city, it's the rock is obviously the, you know, the really iconic thing. But if you have that just off in the background, it'll feel more interesting than just shooting down straight down in the sand at whatever you're looking at. Um, or of a beach cleanup, you have a whole line of people. If you can get to one side and, you know, show that whole scene going on and then the Cape in the background and the rock and off to the side, it kind of, it leads you through the image and makes it, a lot more of a pleasing, pleasing to the eye. Um, what else? I think of some other really simple things. One thing to note, if you ever use the wide angle, um, the 0.5 or whatever on the, if you have a one of the um, phones that has the, the wide angle lens, um, if, you're, if you put a human or a dog or anything too close to the edge of the frame, their, their, their arms or their face or their legs will stretch out and look super unnatural um, because it's a super wide angle lens. And it's kind of like an old fisheye almost and it'll make people, but it's correcting and not making everything rounded. So it just stretches people's legs out and makes them look super weird. And so um, just keep that in mind. If you, if you are using a wide angle, try to keep the, the, the people or people's faces towards the center. Otherwise they'll, you know, people have like, really long nose and they might not like you later. So um, let's see, get my notes here. Oh, one thing um, also is, you know, we live in the Pacific Northwest and um, down in LA and Southern California, they have to use these giant, you know, 20 by 20 silks and diffusers to knock down the light a lot of times. And, you know, when we're shooting, when on a, at a cloud on a cloudy or rainy day, those clouds are actually one of the best diffusers we have. And, and it really does help. I often find like the, the, the overcast days when there's a still a lot of sun, it's, it's really beautiful light and it's a really good opportunity. And so 
no one just thinks because it's not sunny that it's not a great time to take images. Cause a lot of times right after a rain or on overcast days, the light is almost perfect for especially people because the, the shadows aren't nearly as harsh on everybody's faces. And um, right now, for example, a lot of my portraits are shot in open shade, which if it is really sunny and you wanna like take a picture of something, have someone step into the shade. Right now I'm actually sitting, it's really sunny out out front, but it's bouncing up and it's making a really, there's almost no shadows on my face. So um, it's one of the best ways to take pictures of people or, or if there's an object you wanna shoot of some sort, bring it over in the shade and just take a quick photo of it because the, the, the shadows will be really nice and even and soft and not nearly as you know jagged and harsh as being in direct sunlight. So um, that's all I have for right now. That's kind of rapid fire. So um, I would love to uh, um, just answer any questions anybody has or just pick my brain, whatever you want to do. So. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. That was great. Um, I'm, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started with photography? Take us all the way back to the beginning. Yeah. Um, so I never really planned on being a photographer. So I, I had, I was interested in it. And when I started shooting um, or got my first camera that I felt like was worthy of publication or whatever was probably in the mid to late nineties. And so it was really, um, you know, it was in the film days, like digital wasn't even really present yet. And so, uh, I had a little point and shoot that, that shot was like a pro, a pro lens. <laughs> um, and it was called the Yashica T4. And now those are really popular with all the, you know, the camera nerds and stuff. Um, but my first real camera, I just bought kind of on a whim. I just got my dog not too long before and a lot of life stuff changed. And I, I moved to Bend and um, started taking pictures of climbing because I was just I was just basically that's was that was my obsession. Um, I'd moved out west from Michigan and I was totally fascinated with rock climbing because I grew up climbing trees and everything. And um, Michigan gave me a love for the water because the Great Lakes were there. But I don't know. I, I always had my sinuses always were kind of bad as a kid. And so I thought I couldn't surf because I might, it would just, I would just sneeze for seven days after every time I go in, go in the ocean, um, if the, there was a bloom or something. And so it took me a long time to actually get into surfing. So climbing was my passion and Patagonia used some images and, um, a few other climbing companies. And I just gradually, I was living in my van. And so I just gradually started um, submitting to different things and just had some lucky breaks, honestly, and, and just kind of, I never went to photography school. Um, I just, back then I studied library books because YouTube wasn't a thing. And and I was shooting slide film, which was incredibly unforgiving. Like if an image was even the tiny bit off, it wouldn't work. And when you're shooting a slide, you you know, the, the photo editor puts it on their table, the actual image you shot and drops it on the table. There's no corrections or no, you can't fake it. And so um, it was really expensive to learn that way. Um, but I'm really glad I did because it forced me to really see things. And then, then I switched to digital in like 05. And uh, my very first images were those ones of uh, Jerry shaping in his uh, shaping bay. Um, and I, I was blown away because it was, normally you'd have to use all these crazy films to shoot in low light and, and, and with the, you know, the shaping lights and everything. And I just, popped a few images off and, and Patagonia published one of those in, um, in, as an ad in Surfer's Journal. Um, and Jerry still says that I'm the only person that ever crawled up in the rafters in his, in his shop <laughs> and got super dusty. Um, that shop got torn down years ago, but Jerry's been a great friend and a mentor over the years. But I love that that was the first digital image that ever got published because it was a, it's, you know, obviously he's so respected in, in our community and in just the surf world. Um, but yeah, it was the, the beautiful thing about it was I, I've never planned on doing it for a living. Um, and so just following what you love really, I guess, pays off because you just keep wanting to do it. Um, in spite of how much of a hustle it is, a lot of people think photography is so all just shooting and it's a lot of, it's a lot of hustling and, um, behind the scenes and editing and, 
trying to figure out what you're going to do next and breaking through the creative ruts and things. So that was a rambling going back, Brie. <laughs> no, that was, that was great. Um, Kristen asked in the chat, uh, do you use your phone to make films? And if yes, do you have any tips? Um, it, honestly, the camera on our phones now, I mean, the, the way they can shoot video is, is phenomenal. I use them a lot for stories. I love using the slow motion. Um, I, I love, I, you can either, you can set it to two different settings. 120 frames is reasonably slow and actually probably a more usable one. If you shoot, set it to 240, that means it slowed down times and it's for something that's happening really quickly. But if you do that for every, the everyday stuff, it's going to look, it's going to move so slowly that it takes forever to get to the point. But I really enjoy shooting slow motion on, on things that, you know, my dog running and, um, you know, ocean waves and things really look interesting in slow motion. Um, another thing I really like to use is the, if you swipe all the way to the, um, the left on an iPhone, uh, the time-lapse app, um, I love using that for um, when clouds are moving really quickly, you just set it on something um, or the lights changing really rapidly. Um, building my house, I've been using that a lot for all this stuff to set it up and it's just interesting to see something unfold as it's happening. Um, I love using that out um, back when we flew all the time, <laughs> um, out plane windows when you take off and land or if there's really interesting clouds going by. It's fun to just, you just got to hold it really steady if you're holding hand holding it. Um, but you got to, if you do it for about, you know, three to five minutes in a row, it, it creates these beautiful moving images of looking like you're just floating over the landscape. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think you can use your, I mean, the, the quality of the imagery, I've seen a few films on the big screen that were made with phones and it's, it's really not, again, it's not about the, the equipment, it's about like the story you're telling. And so my tip would be just, just what are you trying to say and what and with an image or a, a film it's always like what is the point of this and that's kind of what I always ask when somebody's like hey we should make a movie about this I'm like well why why are we doing that what what is what's motivating you to do it and what why do you want to tell that story and what's the subject and what why do you want to do that so you don't always have to know that answer immediately but as you start to compile footage um you can that that will that will unfold so I think that's perfect for one of the motivations for this training today is to tell the story of why we're fighting plastic pollution. We often ask our volunteers for photos of plastic in the environment, and we are upset by any plastic in the environment. So a picture of a fork on some grass is very upsetting to us, but we're trying to reach the masses that might not care as much. So like when Ben was talking about sort of that perspective, right? Like having haystack rock in the background. Um, I, I found a plastic bag on the beach during our bag ban days when I was at the other haystack rock further north. And so, and not that I'm a good photographer at all, but I got like the plastic bag with Cannon Beach haystack rock in the background. And then it's like, Oregonians are like, oh, that's on my beach and I don't want it there. Um, and so for, for a surf writer, kind of thinking about, you know, what's going to connect with other, with Oregonians that maybe aren't the people that are infuriated immediately when they see trash anywhere um, and kind of getting that perspective like Ben was talking about. And also when you're, uh, you know, like, obviously the one of the most infuriating things we have on the Oregon beaches is the microplastics at the high tide line. And oftentimes, I mean, you can just walk to wherever there's a, you know, background, turn around or look the other direction and just that line of track, that line of plastic goes off. So if you turn your phone upside down and just set it right next to the closest piece or, or use the telephoto that two times and then, you know, pull that all in, it just, you'll, that, that'll have that leading line and that perspective that shows you. And then you get a, get a sense of place where whatever the iconic backdrop is, whether it's just forest or a cape or a headland of, or a rock of some sort. Um, I mean, it's, I feel like that issue is the one that's just, I mean, everybody sees it, but a lot, a lot, oftentimes people just are on the beach, they don't look down. And so it's just, you know, we see it obviously, but 
yeah, telling that story and being like how prolific that really is. Where a big, where, where, you know, during after big storms, where, where it piles up, where a big pile of, you know, this last couple of weeks, I found water, water, soap and detergent bottles from all over the world. And just, you know, if you find some one of, you know, like Korean, you know, like you see, I've seen stuff from Korea and like Russia and everything, just put that in the foreground so you can see that it's actually written in a different language and, you know, bring that all the life out. It's like, okay, we're in Oregon, but this came all the way overseas for years and now it's sitting here on our beach. And so, but most of our plastic comes from us, but it's just always interesting to see that it comes from across the world too. <laughs> well, even the plastic that is physically coming from Asia before the recycling ban was actually coming from us. So we just shipped it over there. <laughs> just came back to us. Yes, the gift that keeps giving. I have a question. If let's say you meet somebody out on the beach or something and they're doing something interesting, but you don't know them ahead of time, but you think they might be a good subject for a photograph. How do you go about connecting with them, making sure it's okay to take a photo and just kind of connecting with strangers that might be good subjects? I've, I mean, I've, I have a tendency to be a really shy person, you know, shy individual. And so I always have trouble walking up to strangers, but if you just ask people to take their or what they're up to or what take their photograph, I find that most people are really into it. You know, they're, they, you know, people are, I feel like even, especially now that people's lives are much more documented because of, you know, iPhones and social media who are more open to it. And they'll tell you if they, if they, you know, that 1% of the time they'll tell you no. Um, but a lot of times you can make a great friend or an ally that way. So for whatever you're working on, so. And if it's for a camp, I mean, if it's for a nonprofit, typically it's not as big of a deal for like model releases and things, but if it's for a big campaign or whatnot, then, then it's important to have, you know, if, if you're doing it for that, then having a model release on hand that you can have them sign and, or a digital release of some sort. So. Yeah, we have to be really careful with youth, um, but a lot of times we're working with a school group and the school has the release, but yeah, we have to be careful with that. So sometimes you have to strategically make sure you don't have any of their faces in the photos. But those are good things to know ahead of time so that you can strategically place yourself, especially if you can't show, use anyone's face. And so you need to be like behind them. Yeah, that's a good point. Like minors, minor, getting a release from minors is a, it's their parents have to be present or they have to have been signed off to the school. So that's, that's a big one. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Ben? Oh. Um, oh, Jean asked, do you need to have a model release for someone's back? So if you don't have their face. If they're not recognizable um, for something that's not for a major campaign, I wouldn't worry about it too much. But if it's for, you know, if it was for an Amex ad or something like that, then I would want the model release for everyone. But it's, yeah, it's, it's more if they're recognizable, if someone could tell it was them. So there's also, I, I've done research in the past, but it's hard to figure out what the space, because there's not a reasonable expectation for privacy. And so for, I mean, for us, we have, we don't have a photo release in our waivers, which is what, um, our events are happening for the most part in public places, like for a beach cleanup, you're in a public place. But, you know, that's something that's always kind of confused me that the law about privacy in public spaces and photography. Yeah, I mean, a lot of street photographers in New York have never had a model release ever. You know, it's, it's like they're, they're just capturing what's happening as it goes by. So there's a, there is a level of that. Um, when it comes to things that, you know, obviously surf riders a stance, then, he, you know, if someone doesn't necessarily agree with the surf rider stance, they could get upset mm -hmm. about it. So I think, you know, if someone's far off in the distance and, you know, they raise a fuss, then it's obviously it can be pulled down or whatever, but that it's more, it would be interesting to get a, a release integrated into the waivers just so, or some sort of a box they could check or whatnot. Um, I don't know. 
I'll get our legal team on it. Does anyone have either any more questions or experiences taking photos that they ended up publishing somewhere or anything like that? I won a state parks photo contest once in Oregon. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I like hard. to, I just take like a thousand photos and then pick the four best ones. <laughs> I also have a nice camera. That's my secret. <laughs> yeah, that's the secret of photographers too. They don't, it's not like every photo you take is brilliant. I mean, if you're, if you're shooting film and you got to slow down, yes. But if you're shooting digital, typically you're trying to capture the moment. So don't be afraid of taking bad ones too, because they're going to happen. So. Um, Kristen just asked if you have tips for shooting from a boat. She wants to make a short video from the water. Um, if you're using your phone, um, there's a little state, there's a lot of little stabilizers out there. I have one called the, it's called the Osmo that DJI, DJI makes. DJI makes a lot of the drones and the, um, the little, you know, the filming drones and, and also, um, I use their Ronin S, which is a small little Ronin for my little Sony cameras, um, for the, just my, the cameras I use for my work. Um, but they have one called an Osmo, um, that you just, you put, download the app to sync it with your phone and, and the record button, it's a stabilizer. So, and it's tiny, it fits in your pocket. Um, and so as you move your hand, it, it keeps the horizon level. Um, and then also has a little record button on it. So you don't have to constantly be poking at your phone. Um, and so the thing about being on a boat or on a plane or anything like that is you're, you're doing this all the time and you're, there's no way you're going to hold your hands level and phone, iPhones are stabilized. So it, it takes better footage than a lot of things would, but there's something called rolling shutter that like makes the edges all like jello -y and it makes it's, it's just kind of disorienting. So if you get a little stabilizer and I think, I mean, I know that one costs maybe a hundred bucks or less. Um, and there's probably a lot of knockoffs out there. Um, they're just, um, just, it's a gyroscopic stabilizer. So they just have a little motor in there that keeps everything running, running smoothly. Um, those are incredible, honestly. And, and if you're, one thing about shooting in a boat too is if the water moving past the boat and things like that, if you if you put that into slow motion and you know do water details and things like that, it just looks so dreamy. Um, water textures at sunset, I could look at those all day long. I mean, they just <laughs> it's and if you especially if you slow them down, um, it just it's very that's just it's so visually appealing. I mean, it's just universal. So um, and then uh, the other thing I would say is you know a lot of phones now are, are waterproof, but if you're shooting with any other type of camera, just make sure you have some sort of a, a dry bag or some sort of a, you know, a lot of the little, you know, Yeti coolers and stuff now are completely waterproof zippers. Find something to throw your stuff in that if there's the rain or, you know, the boat gets swamped that you have a place to put everything um, if everything hits the fan. So, um, so, and phones are waterproof, but those, stabilizers aren't necessarily they can handle some but um i just made a little a little short film um for sony uh, for one of their new lenses um and it was all one camera one lens and i just I did it with my dog nori and we we're just running along the beach and a lot of stuff i everything i did was with that little stabilizer the ronin s and and that one camera and one lens on there and it was it was so much fun and um, I have one of the little pedal electric e-bikes and I would have my girlfriend drive and I would be in the back and just, she'd be running next to me and run it, shooting in slow motion. It just looks like, it looks like you're, you know, shooting from a helicopter or something. Cause it's so smooth. Um, so those little stabilizers, whether you're on a phone or a real camera, you know, a, a mirrorless camera or whatever, it, it's, it's kind of incredible what they can do. And, you know, those sort of things used to cost, you know, you'd have to hire, it costs like. Fifty thousand dollars, and you have to hire an operator to run one, and now you can just grab one and hold their hand. So it's really phenomenal what we can do with filmmaking now, just with what we have. Um, and so, and then you can edit stuff on your phone too, which is crazy. It's just it's, the possibilities are endless. So, quick question: When I am out on the water, I will, you know, oh, I should have taken a picture. Oh, this was so much fun. I just want to 
you know, a shot real quick. So I pick up my camera, take a couple shots, run back home, you know, heat up, whatever. But I noticed that a lot of my pictures have like, um, I've been told sun flares or something. They'll have like a green circle in them or a blue circle. I'm like, what the heck? Or um, is there a certain way I'm supposed to be handling it or just slow down? Or um, when I look back at the pictures, there's always a dot or flares there somehow. What should I do? So sun flares can be really beautiful if they're with certain lenses, but iPhones and some lenses don't look great. It just depends on what aperture they're at. And there's a lot of science behind that, but iPhones I've noticed if you're shooting at the sun, they put a green dot. There is a green dot that will float around and I always try to hide it. I'm always trying to move around and that's when you're shooting into the sun. And so anytime you're shooting into the sun or like the sun is coming from just above you, um, I'll like just hold my phone and I'll kind of, I'll try to see if I can block that flare out with, um, if it's not directly coming in, I'll kind of try to block it out with my hand. And a lot of times you can kind of just, you, it's kind of like using a lens, lens shroud. Um, and uh, so, um, and then also the other thing I was going to say about shooting in or out of the sun is like, watch your shadow too. A lot of times your shadow will be, if you're shooting directly with the sun behind you, your shadow is going to be in the photo. And so a lot of times I'll lay down and get low or, or try to just like move to the one side or the other. Sorry, my tile guy is cutting tile. So it's very loud in the background. <laughs> he decided he'd had enough <laughs> waiting. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, lens flares can look beautiful with certain lenses, but a lot of times in a, like there'll be that green dot that drives you nuts. So just be aware of it and then try to move it somewhere where you can either take it out later with, you know, a lot of photo apps like Snapseed will have a little, there's a healing tool and you can just hit it with your finger, you know, just like make the brush size the right size and, and take it off or, or Lightroom or Photoshop will do that too. Um, or if you can't get rid of it or move it somewhere that it's hidden. So that's going to always happen. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, if you're shooting into the sun, it's gonna. There's a lens flare almost always because it just the way it hits the the round just kind of bring light at you. So I'm so glad you asked that because it drives me crazy too. I mean, a lot of cinematographers that are shooting with really expensive glass love flare because it brings this like you know beautiful like haze behind someone or if someone's backlit. Um, I mean. Uh, the other thing you can do is if you're shooting with people or there's an object in there, if, if you, if the sun's right at your face, if you duck behind, you know, put the person's head over the sun, um, it'll make this beautiful highlight around their, like a special highlight around their hair and like, um, or, you know, it could be a log or whatever. And just, and you, you can get the sun to flare just, just off one side and it can be really beautiful. But if it's just blasting at you straight on, it kind of it kind of ruins the photo often. Um, so if you can just just get knock that sunshine down just a tiny bit, it, it's actually a great tool to make things really interesting. So have fun with it, because <laughs> there's there's really no rules in photography. The whole rule of thirds, I break it every single time I take a picture. So, but it's just a good thing to remember: don't plop the subject right in the middle. You know, otherwise it looks like this zoom frame right here it's just it's kind of not interesting unless you get off to one side and show more more things so totally trying it thank you well yeah, no worries. We, we are almost at an hour so um if you have more questions maybe people could get in touch with you later ben we could include your email and a follow-up email if that's okay yeah of course cool um, thank you all so much for joining and thank you so much, Ben, for taking the time to give us your, your insider tips. That was really, really wonderful. And of course, there's always a little bit of homework for all of you. So we don't want to just talk about this stuff. We want to actually do it. So your homework assignment is to take a photo of single use plastic foodware in the environment and either post it on social media and tag surf writer, or you can send it to us if you're not a social media person so that we can have some of your great photos on file. So I'll be writing up a blog um, in the next couple of days to summarize all the stuff that Ben said. And uh, yeah, and share these tips with your friends too. Everybody wants to be able to take powerful images, so.
Thank you all so much for being here. And thank you very much, Ben. I learned a lot. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. And uh, follow us, uh, Surf Rider Three Capes. <laughs> Our newest chapter. Newest chapter. That's we'll, awesome. we'll include the uh, handles in the follow up email. Great. All right. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. That was just rocking amazing. Thanks, Jean. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, I was like taking notes, 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 notes. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So. I'm going to be out there. Great. Yeah. Love Thank your photos. You. Thank you. Can't wait to see everyone's photos. Yeah, exactly. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye, everybody.